Time now to bring up our speakers for our first panel discussion of the morning. And what we're going to be talking about, first of all, is this idea of increasing access. It's not just reaching people in hard to get to places. Um, it's also that idea of ensuring a ready supply of whatever contraceptives uh, that individual might choose. And that goes to that second point about expanding choice. Does it have to just be condoms or pills? What are the other options? Well, I'm delighted uh, to introduce, introduce up here on stage with me Dr. Margaret Chan, who you'll know is Director General of the World Health Organization. Um, on Dr. Chan's left, we have uh, uh, Dr. Enrique Ona, who's Secretary of Health in the Philippines, and Dr. Joseph Katema, who's Minister of Community Development, Mother and Child Health in Zambia. Ms. Teo Sauer, who's uh, Interim Chief Executive Officer at the African Women's Development Fund. And finally, last but not least, Christian Friesbach, who's Minister for Development Cooperation in Denmark. Good, good morning to you all. Um, Dr. Margaret Chang, can you kick this off for us, this idea of increasing access? What is the significance of it for the WHO? What are your thoughts? Sarah, first and foremost, let me thank UK government and, of course, the Gates Foundation for their vision and for their courage to convene this meeting. It's not easy, but you did the right thing. Let's thank them. I was a family planning doctor in my previous life, and I know what women need. Now working in the big show, what we feel is important is access is important, but access to what? Access to a full range of family planning methods, or people call it contraceptives, so that women can make the right choice. It can be hormonal, it can be a barrier method, long-term, short-term, reversible. I mean, it is our job in the big show to convene partners and scientists to give you the best evidence in terms of what is safe for women, what is good for women, and men as well. We do have contraceptions for men. Now, access is important. Choice for women is important. In order to facilitate women to make the right choice and to have access to family planning services, they must get the information, they must get the knowledge and make that decision. Women would be empowered to realize that universal access to modern contraception is a fundamental right, a right for them to choose, a right for them to choose a family size as well as spacing when to have the, the pregnancies the family want. Okay, thank Dr. You. Chan, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Joseph Kateba, you have, I mean, we hear these big ideas of, of, look, it's a universal right, people should have access and an access to choice, but you take a country uh, like yours, Zambia, where the population is so spread out and in rural areas, and I wonder how you can aim for universal access in family planning, let alone allow for choice. The Zambian government has made commitments towards improving uh, access to family planning and we commit to increase the contraceptive coverage for modern methods from 33% to 58%. Our approach is uh, three-pronged, has got three categories, policy changes, increasing our financial commitments and improving delivery, service delivery. Under the policy commitments, the government will initiate dialogue with all our stakeholders who can assist us reach the underserved under populations, such as religious and traditional leaders, including other government ministries like the Ministry of chiefs and traditional affairs, local government, etc. This is in order to increase contraceptive coverage from 33% to 58%. This strategy has never been used before, and we consider reaching out to religious leaders is key to increasing usage, as there has been some resistance in increasing of uh, 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 increasing uh, contraceptives. To strengthen delivery of uh, contraceptives 
and to allow the task shifting to community health assistance and trained volunteers who will assist us to um, deliver these contraceptives to the community. Uh, we will increase as government under budgetary allocation, we will increase the budgetary allocation by 100%. These funds will go towards procurement of family planning commodities and program management. And uh, we will endeavor to secure financing for family planning through existing donors and uh, expansion of existing partnerships. Under service delivery, our commitments are to strive to eliminate the unmet need of family planning through improved universal coverage of family planning through an expanded method mix and increased access, particularly to the underserved uh, population, especially the rural population and the adolescents. To strengthen the supply, of, uh, supply chain for family planning commodities through expansion of essential medicines logistics, improvement program and other channels. Uh, and uh, we'll strive to utilize sub-district structures to generate demand and dispel uh, the myths and uh, open up the dialogue around family planning issues. So you, and you're doubling the budget. You're doubling the budget, but relying on donor countries to, for, for that, the funds. We will, our partners will contribute as they will, but government has committed to expand our budgetary allocation by 100%. Right. Dr. Kitema, thank you very much for the moment. Uh, Dr. Ona, we heard there, I mean, the difficulty of reaching out for religious leaders, which is what they're doing in Zambia. For a country like the Philippines, a Catholic country like the Philippines, how do you make sure in your country that the poorest have information and have contraceptives if they want it? Well, <coughs> in the Philippines today, uh, the Aquino administration believes actually that access to family planning information Services and commodities is a fundamental and essential right and is key to our national goal of inclusive growth and sustainable development. Our government believes it is our responsibility to guarantee and ensure that all women and men have access to a range of all legitimate family planning methods should they decide to do so. So as a Catholic country, there's no problem about that. We are working therefore right now to establish a national policy on reproductive health and population development and to make sure that the funds are allocated annually and regularly to implement this vital policy and for the first time. In 2012, our administration has allocated 11, 15 million dollars for the purchase of family planning commodities for poor women of reproductive age with unmet needs, and we intend to increase it for next year. We intend, and we have started actually, to expand the provision of family planning services to all our women, but especially to our estimated 800,000 poor women who continue to have more children than they have wanted to have. Our study shows that these women get something like 5.2 uh, fertility rate or children, but actually they wanted only 3.1 children. So our program of universal health care today with a zero co-payment for family planning services for these women is our bold step to ensure that they have an informed choice and that they can access the services they need. Okay. In addition, we are currently upgrading our public health facilities and increasing and capacitating our health personnel 
to achieve our MDG targets and provide the needed health information, the guidance, as well as the services they need. So today, we are intensifying the convergence efforts with local and foreign partners to join us deliver the counseling, guidance, and family planning services our men and women need. And I hope that this is going to be the start of uh, assistance that we hope okay. the Philippines can partner with everyone of you here okay. this morning. Thank you. Dr. Ona, thank you very much. It's one of those the statistics, the children, 5.2 children rather than 3.1, which is, of course, I mean, sometimes those statistics can hide the fact that we're talking about people here and individuals, and this is two, two extra children that they didn't necessarily want. Um, Teo Sauer, uh, at the African Women's Development Fund, now you've been giving money to people effectively or funding things for 10 years, but it's only recently that you've put a new focus on family planning. Why is that? Well, the African Women's Development Fund was set up by African women for African women, and we fund across the continent. So we make it our business to listen to what women are saying to us, and to listen especially to the almost 1,000 organizations that we've funded in the past 12 years. And what we're being told everywhere we go, what we're being told by those organizations, what we're being told by women activists on the continent, by women in rural areas, women in urban areas, is that family planning is really important to them. Not family planning in a silo, not as a vertical intervention, but family planning as part of reproductive health, as part of a whole approach to realizing and implementing women's rights, as part of an approach to development on our continent and making sure that the continent reaches its full potential. And so we've added family planning as a grant-making um, area, but we're also supporting women leaders in other areas because that's what we do. And we're really proud to be associated, along with IPPF Africa Regional Office, with the African Women Leaders Network on Reproductive Health and Family Planning. And they're this fantastic collective of women women leaders, everything from presidents and former prime ministers to fantastic musicians and entertainers with really fantastic constituencies. And they are raising African women's voices and saying what we want is access to comprehensive, voluntary family planning and reproductive health. And we need this to happen because this summit is wonderful and it's great that DFID and the Gates Foundation have pulled all of these people together. The commitments are wonderful, and it's great to hear of them. But if this is to work, then we have to have women as central to this initiative, and not central as recipients, but central to the planning, central to the ideas, central to the vision, central to the decision-making. It's not to say that men aren't part of this. Men have to be part of this, but women have to be the core. And that means that we have to hold ourselves accountable to the women of the world for the success or otherwise of this initiative. So a year down the road, two years down the road, we should be able to sit here. And instead of counting our failure, and to be fair, we have failed the women of the world and the women of Africa, and we can count that failure in the number of women who die giving birth. And I'd like to see us here counting our success in terms of the number of women, the number of children, the number of families and communities that are alive and healthy and reaching their potential. Christian back Denmark, sort of known as one of these sort of ideals for women's equality and for empowering women, and this is and it's reflected as a donor uh, government and country in, in what you do. What do you see the role of family planning in this? Because we're hearing that you know, there's lots of sort of reproductive health and other services, but family planning itself. Well, we, we see it coming together. Uh, and I, I guess we build on the Danish experience, how uh, gender equality, women's rights, and sexual reproductive rights has to be seen as a package and coming together. And, and, and the sexual reproductive rights all the way, you know, from the sexuality, uh, education, to access to contraception, modern contraception, to safe abortion if needed, uh, and, uh, and to maternity health. And, and what has it has done to Denmark, you know, is, is, is a 
tremendous change, and not only for the women, a golden opportunity for each and every uh, woman, but also a golden opportunity for Denmark uh, in bringing and building a prosperous uh, uh, country, uh, as Ms. Sova uh, also indicated it. So this, this comes together, and, and it should be seen as such. And I believe it's very important that we also move from, or we have to have a focus on, on numbers and access and contraception and financing, and it's a very needed agenda. But it has to be seen as a human rights issue. Uh, I think that's an important message we should send today. And the sexual and reproductive rights should be center stage in, in, in what uh, we do. I think this is a very important uh, message, moving on from human numbers to human lives and to human rights. And I think that's the Danish position, and that's what we are here to, to also promote. Dr. Chan, that point about the fact, and you made it at the outset, that in a sense it's been rather neglected up till now. Is that because it can be controversial, it is difficult for some people, or people just don't understand its importance? Well, family planning has always been uh, a very interesting subject in the sense, depending on where you stand. But we, let us not forget what Jane told us. Jane had the courage to dream the possible dream, not the impossible dream. But at the end of the day, we have heard from governments, from civil society, they recognize this is the woman's right to choose, to determine their future. And I'm very happy to hear governments put in place policies, increase money, working with civil society, public-private uh, partnerships, international organizations to make women's dream possible. Now, David Cho, as a specialized agency in UN for health, uh, we must, and I f agree with Theo, moving from the family planning summit, the next thing is action on the ground to benefit women, to reduce the number of women dying from giving birth or suffering from poor health because of lack of access and choice to contraceptions. Now, how can David Cho contribute? Number one, we will bring together the partners, the scientists, to do research and development based on the best science and evidence to come up with recommendations on a range of contraceptions. As I said, it can be hormonal, barrier, short term, long term. Let me also share with you one little story. Standalone family planning program, of course, is important in some places, but in some countries, women would not come forward. And it is important for us to understand the need and the importance of integrating them in the full range of sexual and reproductive health services, and it is also good value for money. Now, another important thing that Victor must scale up is we can pre-qualify products from different countries to increase the availability, to stand behind the quality of these products so that increase the availability, the supply, and reduce the price. Pricing is important for many countries so that you can stretch your development dollars and also your health dollars. Now, WHO, of course, need to work with partners to support countries to strengthen the system to provide quality family planning services as part and parcel of a total package. We all talk about, last but not the least, Sarah, we need to track promises, we need to track progress, and we need to track results, and as part of the accountability framework. And that picture was very proud to be given the assignment by Mr. Secretary General to set up a mechanism to track you know, every woman, every child's progress, and family planning is an important part of this every woman, every child, and the UN strategy on improving the health of women and children. Lovely. Now, some of the things that you've mentioned we are going to be coming back to during the day. There's just one thing I wanted to pick up, which you make the point. In some places, it's available, but women aren't coming forward. And that's a cultural thing. And I wonder your experiences of those where, you, where a, child, a girl gets to teenage years and her parents expect her to get pregnant. There is an expectation. Tay, I wonder you know, how, how you can tackle that. Well, the thing is, I think it varies in different countries. There are countries where that is the case and there's the expectation. I think even more importantly, there are huge numbers of women who don't know that there is any kind of choice, where a child's a mother herself has never had the information 
let alone the ability to space her children, to know that she has those choices. And so how can she, how can the father, how can the family pass on knowledge that they don't have to children? So yes, in some cases, there are cultural issues to be overcome, but I think in many more cases, there are issues of real information and education. And actually, education is one of the best family planning techniques you can have. Dr. Katen, can I just ask you something? We, we've already heard sort of some people saying, look, it's not what's said today, it's what happens afterwards when people go home. And I do wonder, I imagine everybody going home, to, you go home to your country, and we're in a, you know, the whole world is in this sort of economic crisis. And I wonder how hard it is then to translate the, the, the ideas and the hopes from here into the reality, political reality at home. Actually, uh, the Zambian government is in course already. We have put up mechanisms in place. Um, these women who have got the unmet needs are by and large women from households which are poor and vulnerable. And uh, traditionally, my ministry used to be Ministry of Community Development and Social Services, and it targeted these vulnerable and uh, marginalized uh, households. And government has taken mother and child health component from the Ministry of Education and given to my ministry, Ministry of Community Development, which handles uh, empowerment of these vulnerable people, and given this mandate of maternal and child health to my ministry, so that as we empower our women and households with putting food on the table, we as well empower them to make these very decisions of uh, family planning and spacing. So it's a very firm political commitment. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to thank the panel. Dr. Joseph Katema, uh, Theo Sao, Christian Friesbach, Dr. Enrique Ona, and Dr. Margaret Chan, of course.